Hi, I'm Edwin Rutch, and this is Dialogues on Building a Culture of Empathy. And uh, today I'm here with John Gibbs. Uh, thanks, John, for joining me for this uh, dialogue. Oh, I'm happy to be connecting with you in this high-tech way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you had your tech guys there. The, your development, uh, a professor of development psychology at uh, uh, Ohio State University, and you're telling me you had your tech guys setting all this up for you. So. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I want to just introduce you. As I was saying, you're a developmental psychology professor at uh, Ohio State University, and you're the author of a book, Moral Development and Reality. Uh, you, your work focuses on uh, developmental theory, assessment of social cognition, uh, moral judgment and cognition, and, uh, and moral, let's see, in, and you do interventions with uh, conduct disordered uh, adolescents, and is there more by way of introduction that you'd like to share? Well, uh, uh, juvenile and adult offenders, if I put in a plug for the adult offenders, this came out uh, last month from uh, Springer, so, and the juvenile version is, is here. So, you know, that's right, I am also involved in, with colleagues with uh, intervention work. Okay. Which we, oh, sorry. Very important, by the way. Oh, great. Yeah. So, um, what we're here to talk about is uh, you'd written, you know, co authored an article called Hillary Has a Point uh, in Defense of Empathy and Justice. Mm -hmm. And you'd co authored uh, on that article uh, with Martin Hoffman, who is professor of psychology uh, emeritus uh, at New York University. And he also authored this book, put in a plug for him uh, uh -huh. Empathy and Moral Development. And, uh, your article, I guess, was really addressing uh, some criticisms of empathy by Paul Bloom from uh, Yale. Uh, and so that's what we want to talk about was uh, your article. And I was just curious, how did that article come about that you and uh, Martin Hoffman wrote? Well, I uh, was sending as attachments, in case he hadn't seen it, uh, various writings by Bloom and uh, saying, what do you make of this? Uh, what do you make of that? And uh, Marty is saying, gee, I wish I had the energy to reply to this. Why don't you write a reply and I'll be second author? So that's how it came about. Oh, great. Um, well, I've had a lot of uh, dialogues with uh, Paul Bloom as well. He's writing a book called Against Empathy. He wrote uh, articles that came out in the New Yorker against empathy. So he's become one of the major uh, critics. And I've tried for two years to engage him in a dialogue like this, uh, you know, a, a recorded uh, dialogue, but he refuses to talk to me. We talk via email, but, you know, in writing, kind of a more controlled environment, but he won't talk with me uh, directly. So. Um, I'm glad that we have a chance here to talk about what uh, you th about your article and what you think about his uh, uh, comments and criticisms of empathy. And um, I thought maybe we could start like about the definition of empathy. Like, how are you uh, defining empathy, and how do you see he's defining it? Well, you know, I have to say I'm a social developmental psychologist, and so of course I'm going to emphasize the developmental dimension of, of empathy. And I really go uh, along with, with Marty's work on, on this subject uh, that fundamentally empathy is an emotional state that's triggered by a feeling or an emotional state of another. Um, uh, and it can involve what one may uh, expect is would, would be how one would feel in the other person's situation. Uh, Marty talks about self-focused empathy and other focused empathy and actually both combined as as optimal. Um, but when I say fundamentally a, an emotional state, um, again, getting back to the developmental concept, uh, there are multiple layers of empathy. And uh, some folks talk about affective empathy and cognitive empathy. Really, developmentally, you start with basic arousal mechanisms, as Hoffman described, like mimicry, conditioning, direct association. And then with um, cognitive development, language development, good parenting, um, you start to develop a deeper and fuller and more mature multi-layered form of, of empathy. Uh, so it, it's fundamentally uh, a feeling or an emotional state, but then 
uh, with development it becomes a more uh, full-fledged uh, uh, kind of uh, phenomenon that includes perspective taking. So it's a, it's a complicated uh, concept then. Uh, oh, we're getting a little bit of echo here. Um, so it's not a it's not just a real simple uh, one simple thing, but it's a whole it's a more complicated term. I think that's part of the problem with uh, with uh, Paul Bloom's article, um, uh, well, well his work, is I never know what he's talking about when he says empathy. Like uh, my definition definition of empathy is sort of based on the Carl Rogers approach of feeling into someone else's uh, experience. Uh, and still having your own awareness of yourself too, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes I mean what Carl Wright, what uh, Paul Bloom seems to be attacking is emotional contagion, where uh, and he talks about he says I don't want my therapist he says he has a therapist, you know if if I'm coming to my therapist and I'm depressed or angry I don't want my therapist to be depressed and angry as well. And so he's attacking that uh, either kind of like a sympathetic state matching or this emotional contagion, which is not what I'm kind of really calling uh, empathy. My, you know, from my point of view, that it might start with empathy, but then it's going into kind of like a secondary experience. So just wondering how that lands. Yeah, with that's you. Right. In, fact, in fact, that initial definition I gave of uh, you know, feeling what someone else is feeling is is really not. Uh, a nuanced uh, definition of, of empathy, and, and Marty Hoffman is very good at describing that. Uh, he talks about various causal attributions that one infuses into the more foundational kind of, of empathic responses. Uh, so you can get empathic anger. You can get um, uh, you can get a, a blaming the victim. Uh, you can get uh, a sense of empathic injustice, uh, so on and so forth. So. When you add the cognitive factor with the higher layers, it, it, whether empathy translates necessarily into helping another appropriately is um, that's another that that gets a little tricky. And and Hoffman I think is very good at describing the limitations of empathy. On the one hand, he says uh, empathy is the bedrock of morality. He says it's the glue of society. But he also says that empathy is not a panacea. That empathy has flaws. He goes on to say that the flaws are not fatal flaws. And I guess that's where he and Bloom would start to part company. Uh, I get the impression that Bloom just wants to sort of give up on empathy. I mm -hmm. mean, maybe flashing, talking about the case of against empathy, because he does acknowledge that uh, a diffuse compassion is is okay, uh, a, an empathic spark is okay. But he takes the limitations of empathy, which Hoffman has written about for decades, and gives up too easily. I, I think we said in our blog that. Uh, he throws the empathic baby out with the limitations bathwater. You can work with those limitations. You can correct those limitations, and that's what you know. Hoffman and I uh, emphasize. Well, maybe we can well, go through the steps, steps of your article. article. Uh, you started uh, with uh, uh, a quote with Hillary Clinton uh, saying uh, Hillary Clinton had said uh, uh, that we need to stand. I think she gave a, a couple of talks where she said that. Uh, the United States needs to uh, empathize with our neighbors uh, and other countries, and um, then Paul Bloom, as you're saying, kind of criticizing that that uh, that uh, viewpoint. And so maybe we could just go through some of the steps of, of your article, like how you set it up and reasoned it. Well, there there were two parts to what I took from Bloom. One was to say that we can't really empathize. We, we don't do it very well. Uh, we certainly do it as well. We certainly don't empathize as well as we think we can, um, especially in cases where someone's situation is very different uh, from our own. But then secondly, even if we could, is that really such a good idea? He, he talked about empathy as being narrow and parochial. So apropos of the first point, though, uh, Hoffman emphasizes the fundamental commonalities that people have, even quite different people. Uh, and so uh, Bloom might be a little bit too um, discouraging uh, about that potential. I, I know uh, Derek uh, Parfit in a book uh, in 2011 said, although we could not possibly be uh, the horse that we are whipping or uh, the trapped and starved animal whose fur we are wearing, um, uh, now wearing, uh, 
we can imagine such things well enough for moral purposes. I, I really like that quote because I think it makes that point that, yes, uh, if you wanted to take a straw man about uh, perfectly getting in someone else's shoes, of course not. But, you know, maybe we can take others' perspectives well enough. And, I, and Hillary's point is that we should try to be doing that. And, and that would be unfortunate if uh, Bloom's, if the thrust of Bloom's comments are then I'd even try to take others' perspectives. Mm -hmm. So the criticism is we can never fully empathize with someone, their full experience. And what I'm hearing you say is that uh, we don't have to have it perfect, but there's, there's, we can empathize enough, uh, understand people's experience. And it yeah. doesn't have to be perfect to be used as a, a, a moral guide. Um, that, that's right. And then the, the second part of the, his critique, it does have to do with what Hoffman calls the, the limitations uh, of empathy. And I'm really frankly surprised that Paul didn't pick up on uh, Marty's terms here, because Marty quite nicely lays out two basic limitations that he sees in empathy, one being what he calls empathic bias, and this is, I think, a, a big uh, concern of, of Paul Bloom's, that when he talks about narrow and parochial, he's saying that, that, that the way Hoffman puts it, there's a kind of a selective attention uh, in our empathy that we're drawn to a highly salient, highly intense distress cues, and sometimes that can be at the expense of others who are suffering at least as much, uh, but who's, you know, here he calls it here and now bias and similarity, familiarity bias, uh, and those who are not as familiar or sim similar to us and who are not immediately here and now um, can get the short end of the stick, as it were. And I think Daniel Batson um, had demonstrated that in, in some classic experiments. So that's that's a legitimate concern. Uh, Hoffman also mentions empathic over-arousal, and that's, that can be a concern, too. You've heard of compassion fatigue. There are cases where we just get so overwhelmed with empathy that we become immobilized and paralyzed and uh, but Hoffman also emphasizes again that we can, we can there are things we can do to cope with that there are ways to reduce empathic over arousal for example um, that's why healthcare professionals in, in trauma situations uh, need to have distracting and soothing breaks every now and then and look forward to maybe a rest and recreational break and so on and then they can go Back into back into this movie. It doesn't mean that they should uh, sort of give up on, on, on empathy or, or, or caring. And similarly with uh, empathic bias, um, you know, sometimes Hoffman cleverly writes that you can recruit that against itself. You can, um, you know, take a, a, a specific case, but but frame that specific uh, instance of, of someone suffering as representative of an entire group that's mm, suffering, mm -hmm. the child and so on. So there are things that we can do to uh, to attenuate at least these limitations that Paul Bloom is l understand legitimately concerned about. I guess we're mainly just parting ways with whether you, as you know, to use that metaphor, you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater here. I mean, empathy certainly really rather odd to start to um, uh, uh, sort of uh, classify uh, uh, empathy as not even a part of the realm of morality. I mean, granted, you know, in our view, and I talk about the word co-primacy in, in, my, in my Oxford book, um, empathy and justice are co-primary. They, um, they, they, ideally, they would work together in a deep partnership. Uh, and a number of philosophers have, you know, Franklin and others have, uh, have articulated that, that um, empathy serves justice. Um, because, you know, what is justice ultimately? It doesn't just seek the right balance of care. Uh, but then also, uh, perspective taking can, can serve justice, uh, you know, and I mean, I call it the golden rule or what have you. Would victimizers in the right mind really want to trade places with their victims? So there's, a, there's an intimate interrelationship there, and it's, it's, that needs to be appreciated rather than banishing one of the partners from the realm of morality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there was uh, three points there. The one was uh, two criticisms of uh, empathy. The one is that it's parochial, that there's a bias in terms of maybe if there's a room and there's uh, five people in the room, that you might empathize more with one person than the other. So it's not equal empathy for all parties? Is that kind of the, the bias notion? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, but, but, yeah, but for me, when I approach empathy, for me, empathy is like a, a core foundational value, and I, I'm coming from the position that we need to create a culture of empathy to make empathy mm-hmm. a primary social value. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I see uh, this, uh, what you're calling a bias, I see it as an unempathic bias. That if we were actually empathic, we would be empathizing with all people, mm-hmm. as well as supporting uh, pe- everyone empathizing with each other. So it's like creating a like a culture of empathy, of mutual empathy, and creating an environment that supports that. And uh, mm-hmm. I've done like conflict mediation, where uh, there's two parties, and you know generally people will have kind of like this victim offender approach like well they see one person as the victim and one is the offender and they go rescue the the victim so they're kind of having empathy for you know the victim and then even going into maybe a sympathetic uh, response but with a real empathic response you know as a mediator I try to empathize with both sides try to hear both sides and where they're coming from and then once they've been heard, usually they're in, in high stress, high tension states, they can't even hear each other. But when somebody empathizes with them, they start feeling heard, they start calming down, their stress goes down. And then I ask them to empathize with each other, do like empathic listening or active listening and support them in empathizing with each other. So, and then, you know, more often than not, they'll actually start hearing each other, the conversation gets slowed down, and they'll start understanding each other, and then there's a shared action that comes out of it. So Mm -hmm. the lack of empathy for one person or the other, I see it actually as not a empathy bias, but an unempathic bias. Does that make sense what I'm yeah, I mean, and, and by the way, two things. One is, uh, Hoffman makes an excellent point that uh, to reduce the vagaries of empathy, how it's so dependent upon the variations and in the intensity of, of distress cues, you can embed empathy in uh, a moral principle such as justice. And that gives it more stability and more, more duration. Um, you know, uh, Hoffman also says several other things. He says that. Uh, that empathy on the one hand is reliable because there are these multiple arousal modes going from mim- mimicry uh, at the you know the earliest uh, modes to perspective taking and, and mediated association and, and, and so on which expand the scope uh, and so on and so given these multiple modes um, at least one or two modes uh, you know are, are available to kick in and uh, and promote uh, the reliability of the response, but he also says that empathy is fragile, and I think that's true too. It, and empathy can be easily overwhelmed by egoistic motives and uh, and and other states, um, uh, and and culture for that matter, cultural influences that that might be inimical to uh, to empathic caring. Uh, apropos of, uh, of of your um, you know um, kind of uh, uh, efforts and um, uh, endeavor to uh, to serve as a sort of a constructive mediator when uh, people are not being, as you say, mm-hmm. empathic. Uh, I think that's that's all well and good. I want to be kind of careful with respect to discussing situations of offender victim because sometimes it's not just a matter of well each side is you know working in good faith. I mean, our offender program actually analyzes antisocial behavior as essentially a problem of self-centeredness or not taking others' perspectives, uh, not empathizing with others, and having a, uh, an entire worldview which is uh, very self-serving and, and predatory to, to others. So with our, our offender programs, I mean, we have all kinds of ways of trying to induce chronic lifestyle offenders. Um, to begin to perceive the world from someone else's point of view, not not in order to get over on that person or to manipulate or, or victimize that person, um, but to see that other person as a subject the way they're a subject. And we have some you know some studies that indicate that if you do this kind of social perspective taking, 
uh, program with offenders that it reduces recidivism and, and pr uh, promotes the uh, the moral climate of the institution and so on. Yes, what I'm hearing there is that uh, that the uh, offenders tend to be self uh, centered in that sense. They're not thinking about how their actions are going to affect someone, whether it be a crime or, or a murder or whatever. And that uh, your work, you're trying to have the, the person that is, is, is uh, offending or not having this empathy for others, trying to find ways for them to develop more empathy. Is that kind of the essence that's, of what you're saying? That's correct. And we start by trying to develop um, a culture, a positive culture, a small group culture, but um, a lot of work, traditional work along this line. You've probably heard of milieu therapy. There's a, a, a guided group interaction. There's positive peer culture, and um, now we bring to that some more cognitive factors like what, what uh, we, we call self-serving, identifying thinking errors or self-serving cognitive distortions. Not only the basic thinking error of self-centered. Uh, but also secondary um, errors, and we do call them errors, such as blaming others, or blaming the victim, uh, minimizing the harm that you've done to others, mislabeling it as if, as if, as if it were even something positive, and assuming the worst about others' intentions. Uh, Ken Dodge here uh, experimentally demonstrated what he called the gratuitous attribution of hostile intentions uh, to others. So uh, we have to work on correcting those distortions, and that's a, a crucial part of the perspective taking that a, a lot of you know chronic offenders need to need to do. Okay, so what I'm hearing there is that within your work, you're actually looking. You have tools and processes and ways to take uh, someone who has that self-centered uh, approach and and work, bring them into a more empathic way of being. That's that, that's right. And mm -hmm. uh, so once we start with the uh, trying to cultivate a positive culture, we call it, and we do that through what we call mutual help meetings. Uh, then we start a curriculum, and the, the curriculum is to impart uh, helping skills uh, for the individuals, for the group members, um, for helping one another, but of course also themselves as well. So we have uh, anger management, which really emphasizes a lot of anger has to do with self-serving thinking errors, and so we go through a lot of, uh, of that. Um, and we do uh, social interaction skills. Uh, which is all about really getting beyond the level of put downs and threats, and 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 start to get to listen to someone else's perspective, but kind of in the in the way you described in some some of your episodes, um, in order to have a more balanced and constructive um, mode of interacting with another person, uh, and then uh, moral development, moral uh, because a, a, a lot of there's a lot of research I worked with Larry Korberg many years ago, and there, there's a, a lot of work coming out of that line indicating development of delay problems with a lot of offenders. Uh, and again, that has to do with the self-centered theme. And, and so we try to remediate developmental delay through problem situations and probe questions and so on and so forth. So um, get them up to a more, you know, give them a, a dose of social perspective taking opportunities that enables them to, uh, to get to a more uh, appropriately mature level of social moral understanding and their dealings with others and so on. Well, that would be uh, part of uh, my concern about uh, what uh, Paul Bloom is is uh, arguing or attacking empathy. And I've seen I've seen a study from uh, Stanford, uh, from one of the neuroscience labs there, that if people think that that you cannot uh, grow in your empathy, that that inhibits you from growing in your empathy or even trying. You think, mm -hmm. oh, empathy is a fixed uh, state. And we're either born with it or not, so you know I'm not even going to try to be more empathic. And that that very thought itself uh, inhibits empathy because it's kind of inhibiting you even trying to be more empathic. Whereas it seems that with Paul Bloom, like attacking empathy and saying empathy's you know this terrible thing, that it would have the same effect. That people who are in that self-centered uh, uh, way of uh, being would think, oh, you know. Empathy is this terrible thing. Why should I even go make an effort towards em being more empathic? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. It it is true that uh, I was mentioning earlier about embedding uh, empathy in, in moral principles and so on. I mean, it is true that these larger scale problems do require us to be wary of 
the pitfalls of, of empathy um, and to make sure that we don't start to play favorites or get over, overly involved in, in, in some here and now case and then forget the larger picture uh, of uh, victims who maybe are not uh, as salient at the moment or, or future victims uh, and so on. So I think that's it's good for us to have a balance. That's why, again, not to harp too much, but you know why I like to talk about co-primacy again and thinking of the partnership between empathy and justice, because you know justice is your more um, balanced uh, side, uh, your more decentered side, your more impartial and fair-minded side, and that's certainly uh, a crucial twin pillar among the twin pillars of morality. That's certainly a a crucial partner to, to empathy. It's just I, I hate to see it uh, become so lopsided that, and again, I know I'm repeating myself a lot, mm -hmm. but you develop on empathy in effect and say it's it's causes more, it has too many limitations, too many biases, too much over arousal, just, you know, it does more harm than good, let's just, let's just banish empathy except for a spark here or there, or some diffuse compassion, and just go with justice. I think you have Marty Hoffman and I uh, feel that uh, and, and conclude that um, that Paul Bloom has gone too far in that. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, uh, so I understand uh, balance, empathy, and uh, justice. So mm -hmm. you're not like banishing empathy or having empathy be primary, but kind of hold the two in some sort of a balance. Is that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. And. What about the part with empathy? Because I, I side on, there uh, seems to be, I'm seeing two kinds of justice, kind of like an intrinsic or an extrinsic. I don't know if that's the right term for it. But our, our justice system is set up where you have an external judge, where you, you, know, you have two lawyers who battle it out. It's a competitive system where you like, battle out the, uh, you know, the case, uh, you hire these uh, lawyers who are kind of like uh, gladiators who are going to battle it out and somehow some kind of a truth is going to happen and then there would be these external judges judging you whether you know up or down basically I mean it's, I'm exaggerating here but uh, that's kind of the core of it versus a a restorative justice model or what I would call a restorative empathy model where with that, those models, it's actually a more bring the community together to dialogue with each other to where they start empathizing with each other's experience and they go deeper and deeper to really come to some kind of a mutual understanding. And often the person who is that self-centered person, uh, they come to see how their actions have actually affected someone else because they're in this deeper dialogue. So. There seems to be a couple of different versions of even what justice is. Um, so I'm just wondering how that. Uh, yeah, is. yeah, that adversarial system in jurisprudence. I'm not willing to totally relinquish that. I, I think you have a good point. I'm wondering whether the modality you're describing uh, might be a bit idealistic for broad-scale purposes. Uh, I'm thinking of you know. Why, why does America seem to work, let's say? Uh, well, does it partly have to do with checks and balances, you know, our tripartite governmental system? Um, and, you know, it, there seems to be a, a, a wisdom, a realism uh, to that. And, uh, you know, it might be also a little idealistic to think that, as you say, gladiator style, that, <laughs> you know, adversaries battle it out and then you've got some, some judge. But the hope is that the, is that the judge isn't just deciding with the more impressive combatant, but that uh, he's trying to serve what PJ would call a decentered role, a, kind of what Paul Bloom wants us to get to of a, of a more impartial kind of conclusion where, you know, uh, the, the, the conclusion is one that is the most adequate uh, conclusion uh, for, the, for the issue. So, um, you know, but you know, you're talking to somebody, I, I mean, I, I empathize with with, with what you're saying, and that is my predilection. I know in high school, I almost got kicked off the debating team because uh, I, I would get up there and, and, I, and I would say, now, uh, our opponents do have uh, some <laughs> concerns, and here they are, and so on. However, and, and I was told, no, that's not the way you debate. You're supposed to come out strong and make your counter thesis, you know, your antithesis, and 
uh, and battle it out and don't concede one iota, you know, to the other side and so on and so forth. And I always felt uncomfortable with that. You know, when we do our social skills training with, you know, our Fender program, it's all about balance in which you're, you're supposed to, you know, start off, uh, you know, as you were saying earlier, diffusing the other person's anger by acknowledging what you can honestly acknowledge about, you know, why they're upset and so on. So I was a terrible debater. Maybe I was, you know, I hope to think I'm, you know, better at social skills than I am at debating. But anyway, I, on the one hand, I appreciate what you're saying, but on the other hand, um, yeah, I'm, I'd have to think more about the adversarial mm -hmm. system before deciding that we should just... Okay, so it. what I'm hearing, you have, you have a, there's a little bit of an echo when I first started speaking, so um, there's a, what I'm hearing is you have a propensity towards this more empathic way of being, but you don't want to give up on the existing system and that you're kind of holding the two approaches, whereas I'm trying to make the case for the very extreme empathic, like how do we build a, uh, a a culture really based on empathy, and how do we restructure society so that you know instead of our current justice system, which uh, is incarcerating you know 25 percent of the world's uh, you know criminal so-called criminals, I mean four percent of the population, 25 percent of the prison population, I mean. If that's justice, that I mean, I have real questions about that, and I think a lot of people are starting to have that too. So I'm kind of making the case for how do we build that more empathic uh, worldview uh, and really change the social structures to, you know, make it the society uh, hold that empathic uh, container, I guess. Um, and I even did. Uh, this might be of interest. Maybe we can do an empathy circle with Paul Bloom is that, uh, I don't know if you know, Jesse Prince, he wrote about against empathy as well, and Paul Bloom references him, and Lori Grew, and she's at Wesley, and she wrote a book on, on uh, called Entangled Empathy, looking at uh, an ethics of justice versus an ethics of empathy and care. So she's really looking at this very issue. But anyway, the three of us did an empathy circle together, where instead of debating, with each other, we used empathic listening, so that might be more something that resonates with you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, one of the most attractive figures in clinical psychology is Carl Rogers, and uh, so uh, you know uh, that that idea is is uh, appeals to me. Um, I do recall seeing a film. I don't know if you saw this film. Very interesting. With it was this, it was uh, different psychotherapeutic approaches, one of them was Rogerian therapy, and I think Carl Rogers himself um, uh, came on, and, and there was the same client who went to different... Uh, yeah, Gloria. Different, maybe you've seen it. Anyway, mm -hmm. the thing that involved Carl Rogers' segment was, uh, and, the, and the client afterwards, saying that she felt like, you know, he, she, she felt very much understood, but she also wanted some guidance as to, well, okay, what do I? But what do I do? You know, and and I think that's maybe a, a shortcoming of, of that approach. I mean, at some point, uh, beyond active listening and empathic listening, um, you know, there, there has to be some kind of constructive resolution that that mm. can direction for mm -hmm. the person to. So you're looking for some form of action to take place, like how when you really hear each other deeply, how do you come together to take some mutual action or personal action? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's the like with social skills? I mean, uh, you know, uh, how do you resolve the issue? Um, how do you move beyond it at that point, and, and and so on? Yeah. Well, there's uh, two points. You no, know, Carl Rogers makes the point that the change that hap happens, like with her, with Gloria, is that by going into yourself and really seeing what's underneath, you know, whether the deeper or the emergent. Uh, feelings that you create a new identity, and out of that new identity, you take actions uh, based on that identity. So that's like one form of change. And also mm -hmm. within mediation, there's uh, empathic mediation where the first part is looking at, you know, how do we feel now? How did we feel at the time of the uh, act, the uh, you know, the 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 crime or whatever that happened? And then it's like once that connection happens, the question becomes, what do we do now? 
And within mediation, I'm sure you've come across that, where then the parties talk about what actions they're going to take, and it's a they come with a with an empathic dialogue about coming to a shared understanding of what their actions uh, will be. So yeah. there, it does seem that there is a, a a route from the connection to actually taking joint action together. Yeah, and I do like that 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 notion, the, the, the first aspect of your, your description of that process, it reminds me going back to Socrates who it was kind of an emergentism, emergentism where out of a deeper understanding of the dynamics of your of your concerns and feelings comes a direction and it emerges intrinsically from that process and not something that's externally imposed. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I do like that uh, that that kind of that vision of how action can emerge from that process of you know of empathic listening and so on. Uh, it, it didn't seem to work quite for Gloria, right? Because she she felt a little frustrated. But maybe if it had if it if it been a more you know extended process, maybe she would have started to emerge with a sense of direction for herself. I, I forget the specifics, but it was something along that line. She was you know she was frustrated at least from the from the short time she had where she felt listened to, but what do I do? You know? Yeah, it could also be coming from an authoritarian background. You're so used to being told what to do, it's hard to kind of shift from a more intrinsic. I mean, it takes time to develop that intrinsic motivation, too. Yeah. So that yeah, would be another true. aspect. There's another aspect to the empathy movement, which I've told, talked to Paul Bloom about this, that he doesn't seem to acknowledge. But there's a process called human-centered design, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with that process, it comes out of Stanford at the D School and an organization, a design organization called IDEO. They're kind of the top design uh, company in the world. And they use empathy for design, that if you have any problem, the idea is if you design anything, create anything, that you first need to empathize with people you're designing for to understand what their underlying needs are, and then they have a whole set of tools for really uh, doing a needs finding through empathy. And then once you find the problem, there's a, a series of tools for doing brainstorming of how you brainstorm solutions, how you create prototypes, and how you test those prototypes. And it's a iterative process, and it's an emergent process. So you just keep iterating around these problems. So I think that gives a whole tool set for how you take empathy and bring it into creativity, uh, action, and innovation. So, yeah, I, I did see. You know, sixty minutes had a. That's uh, it. Right. I I love that. That that was uh, very uh, encouraging and thoughtful. And I, I think that 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 uh, format is spreading to other places as well. It's, other people are starting the seminars and programs along that line. Yeah, it's really hot. It's getting into uh, the schools. It's getting uh, co companies like Google are incorporating it into their corporate culture. I just saw that Singapore might be incorporating human-centered design as almost like a, a citywide uh, corp uh, citywide culture as well. So, so that really places empathy. Gives empathy a a core foundational, you know, tool for for creativity and innovation. Well, you, you know, but you know what Paul Bloom would probably say is, um, if if you if you want to design something that's ergonomic or user friendly or adapted to you know the the, the, the needs and uh, and daily routines of of a group, uh, uh, then uh, you know, do you really need to try to step into their shoes? Why don't you just ask them? You know. Uh, but you know that's tricky because I'm not sure there's that big a qualitative difference between interviewing someone about their needs and starting to take their perspective. Uh, so it, I wonder sometimes whether there's a semantic issue kind of aspect to this brouhaha with uh, you know uh, those of us who want to emphasize co-primacy or, or empathy vis-a-vis -vis those that uh, talk about the case against empathy is. You know, when you start, and you were mentioning earlier about the, the, you know, the definition of empathy. When you start to, kind of, the more you dialogue, the more you start to say, well, you know, are we, are we meaning that, you know, are we saying this? Are we? Is there some common ground here, where maybe part of our disagreement just has to do with, you know, different 
semantic ways of describing what we're talking about, what empathy means, you know. Yeah, so it's really important to get together and dialogue about it, to really have that uh, dialogue and to get to that mutual understanding. Yeah, because, and again, you know, as a social developmental psychologist who's much enamored of Hoffman's uh, social development of, of empathy, that includes cognitive development, then, and, and, and Franz Bewald picks up on this too, this multi-layered kind of uh, thinking. Um, then you can start to say, well, there are multiple facets of, of empathy, and um, again, uh, it's not that empathy is a panacea, you know, it does have flaws. Ask the question, are those flaws, flaws fatal? And it gets tricky when, once you recognize the multiple meanings of empathy, uh, the way empathy develops into these, in, into these successive layers, and the multiple arousal modes involved in empathy and so on. And uh, so then you have to say, well, let's see, you know, where we're actually substantively disagreeing and where we actually have common ground. And, and again, then it's, it gets to be a matter of, are we so concerned with the potential pitfalls of empathy um, that we're just sort of, I, I don't think Bloom used the word banish, but it, a lot of his writings, it, it sounds like he really just wants to banish empathy from even the very realm of morality, which, and Marty Hoffman and I think that, that that's why we wrote the blog. We think Bloom's going too far when, as I said before, when he, um, when he seems to be just sort of uh, discounting uh, the whole empathic aspect of what morality means. Okay, well, uh, if if uh, I, I can ask Paul Bloom again, if you do want to have like an empathy circle with you and Marty or any other, uh, you know, academics around this topic, would you be interested in a dialogue with him? Well, sure. I've corresponded with with Paul, and, and I think I sent you my very favorable review. I loved his book. He's a wonderful writer. It oh, he is. Yeah. The origins of good and evil. I did have to build in my caveats, and but I. I subordinated those caveats to my um, enthrallment with his writings. And, and so, for example, I mean, when he talks about the currently popular claim in moral psychology that justice is just a, uh, a feeling or an intuition, a mere itch of evolution that's, that's culturally shaped in, in different cultures in, uh, in various ways, um, you know, I, 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 applaud, I applauded him uh, for that in, in my review. And in fact, wish that he had gone he had gone further. And I think it's especially noteworthy that he uh, defended empathy as as beyond that kind of uh, instinct level, because his own work on what, what sometimes I've heard called baby morality uh, does give the impression that he would he would have a strongly nativist view of of justice as uh, merely some kind of uh, you know. Uh, evolutionary intuition. So I, I, I really appreciate the fact that even though his own work is suggesting that there are germinal roots or precursors to justice, uh, that he also uh, is, you know, defends the, the, the development, co the, the importance of cognitive development to having a mature understanding of what justice or fairness involves. Hmm. Well that would be uh, great to uh, have a dialogue with him together. Mm -hmm. I'll keep trying. Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, closing, is there any uh, final thoughts you have, or? I guess we've we've hit upon a lot of facets to uh, to the uh, to the issue, and um, uh, so I, I think uh, there's nothing immediately that uh, that comes to mind. Um, you know, I keep harping on co-primacy. Mm -hmm. um, I keep and the importance of perspective taking, which is part of the higher levels of, of empathy. It's certainly something that we do in our offender programs, uh, consider it crucial to any effective offender program. Um, I guess one thing that I would mention, I guess, is um, one thing that concerns me um, with those who do take justice as just a feeling uh, that's culturally shaped is that it seems like it brings us back to a kind of moral relativism, uh, and that's why I think, as a social developmental psychologist, it's so important to recognize that there are mature forms of, of morality. I mentioned, you know, my work with Kohlberg and moral judgment stages and so on, and I think that was of concern to to Larry Kohlberg uh, 
as well, and before him, Jean Piaget against Durkheim, is to emphasize that you know that we can identify um, more mature moral understandings, uh, deeper moral understandings, and that that's so crucial to be able to defend ourselves against uh, notions that well any culture is as good as any other culture. Because once you start saying that, you know you can take female genital mutilation. Don't get me started on that topic. I've done powerpoints and that and so on. Um, it's clearly a case in, in my view where uh, a defenseless child is being both wronged and harmed. So, and you need to be able to have a non-morally relativistic stand and, and defend it, especially when empathy and justice align, so that we can take stands uh, against moral wrongs and harms in, in the world. Well, I guess where I'm I uh, guess is, where I'm, is that it with is the, uh, the second okay, great, okay. right. there it goes. Is uh, that I'm looking at that to empathize with everyone and support everyone empathizing with each other. So with genital mutilation, there's whoever I mean with the the, mute, the person that's being uh, mutilated, that they're not being heard. Like what their concerns are is not being heard. And a lot of times, this uh, justice or even the empathy seems to come from almost like an individualistic way. It's like we as individualists that being uh, empathic to someone where the empathy seems more of a relational that we want the whole relation to looking at the, all the relations and for that whole system to be empathic so that's kind of another that individualistic viewpoint versus a uh, systemic relational well it is it is true that you know if you have a culture that um, enshrines certain traditions and those traditions are morally wrong, but to justify them, various myths uh, have have grown up al alongside it. So that, and uh, you've heard of uh, Hirsi Ali, for example, Ayn Hirsi Ali, but she, uh, uh, in excruciating, talk about empathizing. You, you you really empathize with her as a child being victimized with female genital mutilation. Her grandmother thought that uh, she was doing good. Uh, and that was on the basis of, of certain uh, erroneous beliefs uh, in, in that culture. And and uh, here she was teased because before she had, uh, before the the female uh, genital mutilation was teased by uh, school children uh, who had it. But you know there are serious um, medical complications and um, uh, uh, that you know you're probably already aware of. So that it's. Um, in UK, for example, and I think in this country too, it's um, th th these practices are. It's not just a, an innocuous circumcision. I mean, it's a really um, dangerous, extremely painful procedure, an, an, an unnecessary procedure uh, that's perpetrated upon young girls, and uh, it, it's something that, as I say, I've, I've given talks about. And and if that's not a case of where justice and empathy align. Uh, where someone is both wronged and harmed, um, you know, it's it's then then we really have to kind of throw up our hands and say, well, then we just can call anything right or wrong. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to have this dialogue, and I hope we can keep the conversation going. Maybe even bring uh, Paul into this and others because I think it's really that back and forth, empathic, shared dialogue that we can come to deeper understanding. So thanks mm -hmm. again. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you for uh, for arranging this and uh, and making this happen.